This was published on the 17th of December 2019. It's an article from Days. It's been a while, but I haven't spoken about it, so I'll probably speak up. I'll just quickly touch on it now. From Days and Confused magazine, it says, Virgil Abloh's streetwear is definitely going to die. The artistic director of Louis Vuitton menswear on the last 10 years and the next. So obviously it was, I think it was like a decade in review. They interviewed a few people on there, but you know, I'm just going to read this for the interest of everyone else listening. And then we can talk about some of the issues that he kind of spoke about, right? So there's nice little pictures on here, kind of highlighting some of his, you know, um, defining moments. Pyrex, you got the Futura and Louis. You got that occasion when you did the first show with Louis Vuitton and you got some off-white stuff, right? So let's continue here. This is written by a lady called Emma Hope Alward. So let's continue. Um, deep fakes, influences, viral fashion. We live in a world um, unrecognizable from the one we stood in 10 years ago. As a chaotic decade comes to a close, we're speaking to the people who helped shape the last 10 years. Okay, let's continue. 10 years ago, Virgil Abloh, then working as creative director for Kanye West, was one of the group, uh, was one of a group photographed outside of the Comedy Garçon show in Paris. Their outfits, which included Goyard briefcases, colorful thick rimmed glasses, and leopard print trousers with cowboy boots inspired a wave of internet scorn. Much of it was homophobic. Um, I'm not too sure if that was if it was homophobic. I think most of the that infamous picture where they're all standing outside. Where is it again? Was it called? Um, is there, is there, she got a link to it? Nope. They're all tags in it. All these are tags, unfortunately. There was a skit about it. Let's see. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Kanye West. South Park. I don't know. Paris. I don't know what it's called. That. I don't know. What, what was that picture called again? Their first time in Paris. So they're all posing. Yeah, this one, right? So, um... Again, I'm not rewriting history. I don't know if this was if you guys had the same inter interpretation, but when this picture first came about, I remember it wasn't necessarily maybe in the hip hop community there were some people maybe saying these guys were gay, right? But this was still kind. He was still an influencer in that regard. Like people still looked at him as like a fashion icon. So it wasn't a gay thing. It was more so it just looked goofy, and it? it was just a goofy outfit, goofy crew. They just looked all like kind of goofballs. And again, it worked for them in the end. I think sometimes you can look back on stuff that you did that was quite goofy and quite nerdy and a bit cringe. And because you're successful now, you can sort of like ju justify it because of the position you're in now and say, oh yeah, you know, I always knew that thing I did there was going to set me on my path to do this, what I'm doing now. And that necessarily isn't the case. You could just, you could just say, hey, we were some young, enthusiastic, passionate kids trying to get into the fashion industry. We had no way of getting in. So we thought we'd just rock up where we wear what we wore and just kind of, you know, try and crash the system that way. Fair enough. But to say like this was some kind of defining moment or the outfits were, you know, um, gender bending, or whatever is ridiculous. Like they all looked goofy. No one there looked good apart from maybe Taz Arnold, right? Everyone didn't really have their own personal style at the moment. They're all kind of, you know, clumsily uh, walking around trying to figure out what worked for them outfit wise and brand wise. And eventually they got there in it. So it worked on the end. But to say that this was some sort of like, I don't know, uh, defining moment in style and in terms of you know accepting homosexuality in hip hop is just pfft, nah not for me. Anyways, continue. Um, in June 2018, I saw I saw some of that same group reunite backstage at Abloh's debut show for Louis Vuitton, which was amazing, right? To see him, to see kind of you know everything that happened, everything that led up to it, the fact that it was a job that probably Kanye wanted all his he probably dreamed about you know calling himself the Louis Vuitton Don Virgil ends up getting it because he's probably able I always look at Kanye and Virgil like Dame Dash and Jay-Z um Kanye is more Dame Virgil obviously is more Jay-Z he's able to kind of politic and kind of work with and collaborate with the higher ups and the quote-unquote culture vultures whereas Kanye and Dame are the ones kind of shouting from the rooftops about you know they want brand equity they want uh ownership and all that sort of stuff and just ruffling too many feathers so they're not necessarily able to work with a big corporate brand so anyway virgil gets a job kanye kind of probably feels away from it from behind the scenes read between the lines you don't need to be an expert to, to see that and we get to see a combination of their emotions when they hug each other and kind of you know start sobbing and crying because you know fashion is their passion so he continues um in a video i took ablo embraces ib and jasper whose blog about the backlash in, two, two, uh, in two uh, the 2009 trip remains online. What we were actually doing is showing the world that American men, let alone black men, know how to really get busy when it comes to the fashion game. Ibn Jasper talks a lot of shit. He does cut, he cuts a good trim. He does make some good skate shoes and he's a hell of a skater, but he does talk, some, he does talk out of his ass sometimes. I don't know what that's about, but again, um, there is maybe a thing about, you know, it being these straight black men arrive into a fashion week 
right? Because back then, for the most part, the only people really showing out were, you know, magazine editors. You remember that was a time when everyone was obsessed with the Vogue Paris crew, right? In terms of street style. So loads of women or loads of kind of overtly gay guys. So it wasn't a lot of straight dudes kind of doing the thing. Um, so maybe that, but again, I don't think it was that big of a deal, really and truly. They have money, they have means. They could go to Paris and just arrive there and use their celebrity to kind of, you know, get into as many shows as they can. Some shows you can't get into because some brands don't care about celebrities, especially back then when social media wasn't as big as it is now. Now, I think every brand will welcome some level of exposure through a celeb. But yeah, I don't know, man. I think they rewrite history a little bit because they're successful now, which again, they're fair to their... Uh, they are uh, more than... I encourage you to do so because, you know, they did what they did. But let's call a spade a spade. Uh, uh, what we're actually doing is showing the fashion world that American men, let alone black men, know how to really get busy when it comes to fashion game. All right, cool. He wrote, and um, we can't be erased, right? That's, that reminds me of, like, the Jews cannot replace us. Remember that? Those people chanting that sort of stuff. Bit strange that. Um, Ablo says as they hug, he smiles and uh, and the smile of a man who just thought to be there, an outsider, no longer. Anyway, let's continue and get to the interview. So, um, the interview here. Um, where I want to start is actually in 2009 with that famous Tommy Tom Fashion Week photo. How do you feel about it now? Virgil says, if you look back at it in 2019, it, it predicted the idea of democratization of fashion. It's like those impartial, imp, imp, uh, inspirational quotes that say you get made fun of and then in the future everyone adopts what we are making fun of. But not really. I don't think anyone's wearing, um, you know, Tiffany blue uh, body warmers and a weird shirt and trousers that don't fit and yellow trainers. None of this stuff is like, you know, the time. I don't, I don't know. It's just strange to say that this stuff was, what did it do? inspire kids to go to fashion week and stand outside of shows maybe maybe that was social media maybe that was a street style i don't know but they're taking a he's taking a bit too much credit for this i think um but that was one of the fir very first modern fashion images that just went everywhere uh it said that uh, um, it said that those who love fashion are just as important as the industry itself yeah i agree with that 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 was a big part of it because i think that was one of the big criticisms a lot of the fashion editors were kind of um pointing towards Kanye when he put his first show down the Paris Paris runway, right? Do you remember the first um, Kanye West collection that was, wasn't was that well made, wasn't that well styled, it was just a bit, you know, last minute dot com. It was just somebody really eager, really interested in fashion with the means and the money to just put up the money, put up the funds and just make a fashion show, right? He just put it on himself, which is great to see. Um, I think as an artist, I think as a creative, to see someone actually, because that's the thing you have to kind of give ratings to Virgil and all that crew, right? They don't talk a lot. They just do. They make. They do. They put their. They put their mouth. They put their money where their mouth is, and they kind of risk it all. They put stuff out. If it doesn't sell out, they have to kind of, you know, wear that L on their chest. Um, they play in places, and it might, you know, they might clear the dance floor. Like they're persist. They're constantly putting themselves on the front line. So I give them all the props for that. And again, um, I think that was one of the weird criticism they pointed towards the Kanye saying, "Oh, um, just because you're a fan of fashion doesn't mean you should be making it." And it's like, what? Um, there was actually a quote. I've met, it might be a Vogue. Um, it might be a Vogue runway quote, or it might be a what's it? What's her face? Uh, what's the what's the face with, with the, what's the face? What, what's the woman that looks like Quentin Tarantino? Uh, reviews clothes, whatever her name is, right? I remember he used something along those kind of lines, like a really snarky remark, just because he likes clothes, shouldn't be making fashion. Like, what are you talking about? That's the whole reason why everyone makes fashion, right? You make fashion or you make clothes because there's something missing in your wardrobe, and then over time you start to build that wardrobe out, and then you might have a brand. You might have a little micro brand. You might have a streetwear brand. You might have a fashion brand. You might have a, a direct to consumer. Whatever it may be, it comes from a need, a want, something that's missing in your wardrobe. And then you kind of create it yourself because you're creative. So that was a weird thing. So that I agree with. Anyway, it continues. Um, it spoke to the power of self-produced image. Jack and Jill was a blog that Tommy had. Yep, that was awesome. Probably one of the best and still more maybe the best streetwear or street style blog or photography out there. Like, honestly, like such a good place to kind of go back to and look at all the trends that happened from yesteryears he had a real good eye tones um eye for de detail shapes movement just incredible photographer shame that he kind of we lost him to the fashion world but you know he's probably doing bigger and brighter things now uh, that image was a collaboration between his following and us a collaboration come on man he took the picture and you guys stood there man let's just mama mia um how did the fashion industry feel to you then how welcoming was it and I like because he's he's optimist, right? He's always a bit he's he's always a bit happy, happy, clappy and stuff. So it's, I like his honesty here. It wasn't particularly welcoming, but the irony was that there was no security at the door at the Comte de Garçon show. We went to we went to get into, which is cool, isn't it? Because I guess back then, especially if you're, which is probably why 
Imagine, yeah, being around back then, going to shows must have been so fun because it's not what it is now, right? Now you're there, they're flying over the likes of Cardi B and stuff, and she's walking around with like 17 special forces, right? Uh, so the security is having to get heightened in shows, and it's just not the same. And I'm sure after the, that terrorism event that happened in Paris too, uh, that didn't help things either. That, but that was a weird time then, right? You could just probably rock up to a show, no invite, and get talking to the you know the African security guard, you know, drop him some uncle bars, maybe slip him a couple of euros, and you could probably go and see a comedy garçon show, right? As long as you kept you know kept stum and didn't make too much of a noise, you'll be all right. It continued here. Um, by halfway through the decade, you could, you've you gone from standing outside to having your first off-white show in Paris. What did the moment represent to you? Ablo said, I was at this point in fashion where my contemporaries and friends like Shane Oliver, but who by air, were super important to the narratives, were painting this picture of what's to come. At that time, the informal press was only just categorizing that type of designer streetwear. As a designer... You get confronted with the term of your generation, which you have no control over. Okay, that's fair. So you're there, you're making clothes, and they suddenly put the label of streetwear on you when you didn't bestow that on yourself, and you feel a bit constrained by it. I understand, right? From that frustration, I decided if streetwear was going to be the sign of the times, I was going to define it rather than be defined by it, which I like, right? So again, this is the thing about Virgil. For all his inability to make good clothes consistently or with any kind of, you know, rhyme or reason i like his methodology i like his way of thinking I like the fact that he's kind of open and says these things so that when kids are reading it they can be like oh okay this is the mindset i need to have when i'm going into things so instead of kind of being shackled by the term street he decided to kind of embrace it and wear as a badge of honor and kind of if, if, if anything the whole industry has a lot to thank him for in terms of keeping streetwear quote-unquote alive in the sense that it injected more money into it from the mainstream from big brands she will always survive. It's always going to be around. We're, we're perfectly fine, you know. People like um, Nick from Diamond the Supplier, he's a multi-millionaire just from street where he didn't need to like dabble in the fashion game and suck people up in Paris. He's just done his stuff, sat in the Beverly Hills and bought himself Ferrari. So street wear can work. It can make people rich and successful. It can make people, you know, be able to look after their families, um, employ friends and whatever it may be. But it's also good to kind of get that injection from hedge funds, from big brands, from uh you know the lvmhs of this group and all that sort of stuff like it's good to get their eyes on it too so it kind of allows people to kind of have a second lease of life like you know futura is in paris now uh doing that whole gore-tex kirk exhibition i told you before um it's good to see stash those guys around paul mitterman's hanging around there all these guys that were fundamental to where streetwear um has come to come from are still getting money which is then allowing them to pass the money down to the young generation or then allowing them to pass you know so it kind of goes on and on so we have lots of things from in that regard anyway it continues um i feel that at the time most people would be like oh he's not a stereotypical designer i don't know how many shows i've done since 2016 but it's been enjoyable to define the space that i would perceivably be put myself in my motivation is this whole time has been to represent for a generation i'm still thinking about the kid that couldn't get into fashion shows this is the thing that i have a problem with with this guy i think personally I think I still have a bit of a hang up on the whole Ralph Lauren rugby shirts. Remember when he made those off white? I mean, so it was off white or the Paris Vision? The Paris Vision uh, flannels that he bought from Ralph. He bought out the entire stock and he then screen printed the back of them. Didn't didn't even update the tag. Didn't replace the buttons or edit the cut in any sort of way in a kind of needless rework fashion. He just screen printed twenty three on the back, um, Pyrex, and then sold them for five hundred dollars. And it was insane, right? And I remember that was the era when he was talking about, I'm here for the kids, I'm doing it for the kids, for the kids, for the kids. And I was just thinking, this guy is like a charlatan, to say the least, right? It's obviously a cash grab, fair enough, but he's kind of, he. Uh, this was during the era as well, I think, when we saw the dusty Ian Connor. Remember Ian Connor on Tumblr wearing the Yeezys and stuff? That was that era when he kind of noticed that there was this really fervent, uh, younger demographic of kids coming up who were just obsessed with their little icons in the scene like that was young luca young ian maybe mike the ruler maybe a less fat cohen there's a few people right in the scene that were kind of bubbling maybe not rocky because he wasn't wearing that kind of stuff at, at that time but there was a time when he kind of recognized okay these are the new icons so he kind of latched onto that whole idea about kids 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 and he kept talking about it but then none of his clothes really related back to the kids he was talking about he was printing on champion sweats and selling them for 300 dollars which is like this guy's insane so sometimes i think it's a bit convenient to use the term streetwear because again it has a core point it allows him to kind of uh it allows him a safety net if if because fashion's fickle if they decide tomorrow that he's washed up and untalented and not worth the time 
then he will fall back into streetwear or fall back into design trope, which is probably why he doesn't call himself a, des- a fashion designer in that regard. But it's a bit annoying. I don't know. I, I find it a little bit... I find it a bit, a little bit disingenuous, personally. That's just me, again. Maybe it's just my own hang-up on it, but I find it a bit disingenuous um, how you can talk about being for the kids and try and resell them flannels for $500 that you bought for $30. It's just like, what? Um, again, I'm not telling him to sell it for $50, but come on, man. $500? Really? That's insane. Uh, da, da, da. Do you think at that point in 2016, the industry uh, started to open up that it was becoming more of a democratic space and it feels closer now? I've never been one to feel that the doors were closing, which is awesome, right? I'm an optimist, so I don't even recognize that. That's how I got to where I'm at. I think what has helped it go along was streetwear was also a, goal con- a global concept. Designers like myself and Shane had the advantage that European designers in the vein of streetwear helped people understand what's new uh what's the new wave was going to be designers like demna and gosha were all a part of the same creative community we all played a part in what's happened to gosha man since those allegations came about he has been mia he just makes clothes and doesn't appear anywhere in it um i wish they could do that to aaron as well aaron bondroff like uh, again the allegations against him weren't the best but you know i heard, wish there was a word for redemption some of these ogs that were kind of you know were such an important part of my life or part of me growing up and forming my kind of creative vision I wish there was a way back for Aaron Bondroff because we do miss him on the scene, man. It's, uh, I'm, we watched that Heron Preston video of him talking about the rec center again. It's just cool, man. Like, I wish he, he was back again, man. But anyway, um, continue. Um, how did it feel to see the rest of the industry, traditional brands, try to get involved in streetwear to imitate something that wasn't authentic to their heritage? Um, Virgil said it's wild, you know, and it all goes back to the very first image that seems preposterous actually becomes the new norm. I was always trying to look at the positive side. So when I do see brands adopt a new mode of design, that's not traditional and not authentic. That's not in this. That's enough. You know, it's, it's, it's actually inauthentic to me. It validates a validation that we ultimately, okay, let's continue. So this, this reminds me of something you posted on. So the question here goes, let me read it slowly because I'm stumbling on my words here. Uh, that reminds you of something that you post on Instagram after the first Vuitton show. It was a picture of you taking your bow and the caption was, you can do it too. What was your in your head when you were posting that? To come from designing a graphic t-shirt in 2012 to making it to the house to design a collection is awesome. As a young black kid from Rockford, Illinois, from Irrigant Paris, from um, Ghana, West Africa, that was like impossible, you know, like categorically not going to happen in a lifetime. I thought that fashion was one of those industries that would reinforce people like that. Uh, this isn't for you if you don't have this shirt if you don't know but it's true i understand why you'd think that because he was right next to Kanye when he was trying to smash the door down and i'm pretty sure if you're virgil there is i think he's got as far as he has got because of he's quite self-aware he knows his strengths so i'm sure the time that he was sitting next to kanye designing album covers and just being a creative dude he was very aware that kanye was a special one right if you look at the stuff off white dude the stuff he started for louis vuitton and you look at the stuff that kanye's done for yeezy from the ad campaigns to the editorials to the photographers used to the drops to the colorways of the shoes the designs you can see that kanye is definitely the special one right he's the he's the real like you know once in a generation talent when it comes to being able to apply his artistry in different fields and different kind of modes and different planes he's the one he's a special one so i guess if you're Virgil and you're seeing it's like you're seeing your best friend, he's finding it this hard to get into industry. You must be like Jesus Christ. I'm not even five percent of what he's doing, or he, of his level of expertise, and he can't get in. So it must, it could kind of dampen your spirits. But to see him get as far as he has done now is amazing. And again, the sky's the limit for this guy, isn't it? Like he could, he could become the creative director of IKEA if he wanted to. Um, the, 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 so it's going following here. What does it say about Shriver being dead? Hmm. Yeah, here, here you go. So. Um, what do you think will happen to the idea of streetwear in 2020 he says right uh, ne- this is the next decade so in ten- another 10 years wow I would definitely say it's going to die you know like as time will be up in my mind how many more t-shirts can we have own oh, how many more hoodies how many more sneakers I think that uh, like we're going to hit this like really awesome state of expressing your knowledge and personal style with vintage there are so many clothes that are cool that are in vintage shops it's just about wearing them I think that fashion is going to go away from buying box fresh something it'll be like i'm gonna go into my archive which is fair i think he's kind of looking at it more from uh the kids on instagram who are kind of posting their fits and stuff those kids wear a lot of archive pieces you see a lot of you, it's very rare you see a kid that posts their outfit online who has like really shiny brand new clothes everyone's wearing 
kind of stuff that looks a bit faded that might have been bought online that was kind of second hand that was from a past season nothing looks box fresh there are maybe a couple of items in their outfits but for the most part everyone's wearing different pieces because everyone wants to show that they're knowledgeable everyone wants to show that they're about this life no one wants to look like new money right no one wants that which is probably explains why someone like a little yatty or like an offset decided i remember i think little yatty said when he got money he just bought all the shoes that you couldn't buy when you were younger and even shoes before that right he just went out and bought a complete sneakerheads kind of wardrobe full of trainers which is good because i guess value wise you can always flip them if he wants to i think offset did the same thing too um so that idea of kind of you know faking it by just the stuff faking your level of authenticity or your level of experience in the game by buying vintage stuff is cool i'm not I, i'm not against it and also i think it kind of allows those new people who have the means to buy those things to appreciate where the stuff that they're seeing in, in the modern era has kind of come from so it's all well and good but i think to suggest that somehow the quintessential t-shirt hat uh hoodie um long sleeve socks shorts waist bag sneaker and bucket hat streetwear staples are going to suddenly disappear is ridiculous really i think there's always going to be because again streetwear is the entry point for all men mostly offer you know for the majority of the street audience is a mostly a male audience if you want to get into fashion or you want to get into design or you want to get into architecture, you want to get into graphic design, you want to get into creative directing, to whatever it may be called, anything in a creative field, the one entry point that you get into is streetwear. That's your kind of gateway into kind of caring about things. And even if you're, in, even if you're just working in an office job, part of the reason why you have an appreciation for fragrances or you care about the knit that you get for that you wear at work and you, you don't want to buy some shitty knit from H&M, you buy a John Smedley one or you go and buy one from Cos. It's because of your introduction to streetwear. It makes you appreciate um, the the kind of mundane qualities in everyday items, right? Um, it kind of elevates your taste level. It makes you kind of interested in different brands. It opens up your palette of interest. And again, that level of loving stuff and caring for it is going to stay with you forever. So I think the idea of streetwear, what it gives you, what it imparts to you, the kind of path it kind of guides you on will never die. The items itself, I think, in my opinion, will never die because a t-shirt, a long sleeve, a hoodie, a baseball cap, a bucket hat, a woolly hat, a bomber jacket, a down jacket, a pair of jeans and the trainers are the cheapest things a kid can wear to get swaggy, right? To kind of go out there and stunt. I saw recently online uh, out on, on the Uniqlo website, which is probably, you know, one of the biggest streetwear stores in the world if you want to get you know serious about things they had this amazing uh down jacket that's similar to like a north face right a nupsy style down jacket that is selling for like i think 60 bucks so if you're a kid and you want to get swaggy you want to put on something nice and you want to mix it up and you don't have the means to kind of go head to toe stussy you can buy yourself a nice stussy long sleeve a nice uniqlo bomber jacket some uniqlo uh indigo jeans a pair of new balances and boom your streetwear do you know what i mean like so i think the idea that that's going to disappear is gone because that kid is also going to decide, you know what, maybe I shouldn't spend 60 euros on a Stussy jumper. Maybe I should go and make my own t-shirt brand. And then they start making their own brand. And then from there, it kind of cascades. And again, it's it's something for, it's an entryway. It's a, it's a kind of uh, rite of passage for most kids when they're growing up and they want to get involved in fashion. So in my opinion, I don't agree categorically. I think streetwear won't die, especially not in the next decade. That's insane. Um, there are more kids than ever coming into the scene. Like these three models here, I don't know who the hell they are. They're new faces. They're probably all under the age of 18. And they're new kids involved in streetwear, involved in that kind of culture. And there's going to be more of them coming up and coming up again. Like, um, look at the kid that just started designing, who was one of the models for a cold war back in the day. Um, I think Samuel Ross is like, what, 27, 28 or something. This kid was uh, modeling for him five years ago. So he's, I don't know, what, 25 or something. And he's got his own brand that he's starting. So whatever kid he gets modeling for him is going to end up kind of graduating and doing the same thing. It's it's never going to end. It's never going to end. So, yeah, I don't think that's true. Maybe for him, he's probably trying to move away from the streetwear thing. And because, you know, if you're Virgil, you probably have to. There is some kind of level of admission that your trainers seem to be more impactful than your actual clothes, which is, you know, bad because, you know, you'd want your clothes to have some kind of impact. You want your friends to wear it. You know, none of his friends wear his clothes. It's not the most, I don't know, apart from Chinese toys, I don't see anyone wearing it in a cool way. So there must be that kind of level of awareness of that. So maybe he's trying to force himself to in an uncomfortable position and trying to make stuff that isn't t-shirts and hoodies um which is cool don't get me wrong but to say that every, the whole industry is going to follow him it's not it's not true he's not some kind of you know thought leader for streetwear he did allow it to kind of you know he did breathe new life in it by kind of shining a light on some of the ogs and kind of speaking about it in glowing terms and really wearing it on his chest but 
streetwear was existed before Virgil and it will exist after Virgil's gone. So I don't think that's true necessarily. But again, congratulations to him and all his success.